Hey everybody, CVH here, and in today's video, I'm going to be talking about some of my favorite cards in the Elder Scrolls Legends. I've done crafting guides before, tier lists, and I've done discussions on my opinions on some of the best cards in the game and some of the cards uh, that you should probably look to pick up as soon as possible if you're coming into the game as a new player. But I've never really just sat down and talked too much about uh, just cards that I really enjoy from a design perspective and just enjoy playing in general in a video like this. So I decided I'd do it. This is a very popular question. If you watch me on stream, you might have seen me get asked a few times. People come in and just want to know my favorite card in the game. If you've seen me answer that question on stream before, my number one on today's list probably won't be too much of a surprise to you, but I wanted to take today's video and extend that to a top five favorite cards list. Cards that I've really enjoyed in the past playing, and cards that I continue to enjoy from a design perspective to this day. So let's get right into things. My number five on today's list is Necrom Mastermind. Now, keep in mind that when I'm recording this video, the only expansions out currently are the Core Set, Heroes of Skyrim, Fall of the Dark Brotherhood, and Madhouse Collection, the latter two being the smaller expansions, the Core Set and Heroes of Skyrim really being the big expansions. So all the cards I mentioned today will be from all of those expansions that I've just mentioned, or monthly cards, uh, but if you're watching this video in the future, more cards might have been released, and maybe I'll do a follow-up video if a lot of new cards come out in the next year or so, and I'll revisit the topic. But Necrom Mastermind has always been been one of my favorite cards, uh, which might seem odd to a lot of you. You probably haven't seen me play this card too much. Uh, I think this is probably the least overall played card that I'll be talking about in today's video, but I've always just really enjoyed this card from a design perspective. This card really breathes life into the Last Gasp style of decks. Now, that's not really a style that has seen a lot of play, despite Necron Mastermind supporting them. Uh, a lot of the Last Gasp cards are just sort of lackluster. We have some good ones, like House Kinsman, and before it was nerfed, especially House Kinsman and Ashana Vendor, and we also have cards that are just a little bit reliant on RNG and not too good overall, like Balmora, Spymaster, and Brutal Ashlander. And those cards can be incredibly satisfying to play with the Mastermind, but it so far hasn't been enough to really push any Mastermind deck from Assassin to Scout to anything else uh, into being too viable. I've even seen some Archer variants with some new uh, Strength Last Gasp cards from Heroes of Skyrim. Nothing that's really broken into the meta per se. I've seen Necron Mastermind probably most successfully used with Altar of Despair decks in Assassin, and that's been pretty cool, uh, but you know, I'm basically excited about Necron Mastermind for its design implications and moving towards the future of Last Gasp cards. Depending on what gets released in the future, Necron Mastermind could potentially see a tremendous amount of play one day. The, the stats just aren't quite as good enough uh, as you'd expect to justify this card in its current state with the current pool of Last Gasps, but I really do like this card in general. If you really want to see me play this card, or a deck built around this card, I have done a bit on the channel before. You'll have to look back pretty far, a good number of months, uh, but I think I titled the Mastermind Assassin, or you might be able to see me use this card in some Alter Assassin variants a long time ago. Uh, you'll have to look back pretty far, but they are there. Moving on to number four, we have Manticora, and what can be said about Manticora that hasn't already been said? A true powerhouse of a card. Uh, this is one card that was a little bit stronger back in the day. It was nerfed to only affect, you can only target creatures in the same lane as the Manticora you're playing. But this card throughout the game's lifespan has always been basically a staple in any control deck using willpower. And control's a special deck type to me. Uh, when I first got into card games over a decade ago, control decks were the first style of decks that I was really pulled to and wanted to build and wanted to play. And it always felt super rewarding to play them. And Manticora is just an incredibly powerful option for the control decks that exist in Legends. And in my opinion, it's the reason that control decks decks that use willpower uh, have even been competitive at all in the first place. This card has been a three of in all control mage and control spell sword decks that I think I've ever seen. Uh, just an incredibly versatile tool, a Swiss army knife if you will. It, it gets down there, it has a good amount of stats compared to a lot of the other cards you're going to be playing in a traditional control deck, um, and because you're focusing more on the removal, Mandacor also is a removal action basically. Uh, you play it down there, it has the stats, so you can start being aggressive a little bit, you can start dealing with your opponent's threats, and it also has guard. Uh, that was too versatile, actually, because when you could play it pre-nerf, you could target something in one lane, you could remove their threat while guarding against another lane of different, potentially smaller threats. And that was a bit too good for Manticora, but it's still just versatile enough to see play in virtually all of the control decks I mentioned. You're getting rid of a threat, you're guarding against additional damage, and you're allowing yourself to use that 6 power body to potentially get aggressive yourself. Amazing card. I also love the premium art, so that does impact my decision somewhat for style points. Uh, but just a card that is really satisfying to play. Number three on the list is Slaughterfish Spawning. Now this is another one that along with the Necrom Mastermind might surprise a few of you, especially if you aren't longtime players of Legends. A long time ago, many many months ago, uh, while despite Slaughterfish Spawning seeing virtually no constructed play currently, this card was 
all over the place, all over the top tier, the ladder, all over the meta snapshot, because this card used to cost 3. Now, unlike the Manticore nerf, this was a nerf that drastically affected the playability of this card, uh, but I love Slaughterfish spawning. Uh, even though it sees basically no play at the moment, this is a card that I honestly hope uh, one day will eventually potentially be changed back to a 3 cost. A lot of people didn't like this card uh, because it's summoning that 1-1 one, one Slaughterfish that then gets plus 1 or plus 2 plus 0 every single turn uh, in each lane. So it was definitely a snowball card and snowball cards such as the pre-nerf Murkwater's Savage and Crystal Tower Crafter, you know, allowing them to get out of control could just lead to an early steamroll victory. However, the fish themselves, uh, as you probably know if you've played this card post-nerf, they're very fragile. And there are even more answers to them now than there were before. We have more curse effects with drain vitality. Uh, there are more powerful three cost cards like Dark Guardian that would compete for the slot of the three cost with Slaughterfish spawning, as well as serving as a good answer to the fish themselves. Uh, powerful plays that take over the field late immediately, like Brotherhood Slayer. If that card comes down first, playing a Slaughterfish spawning like as a 1-1 one, one in the field lane, because one goes into each lane. Uh, so basically, the counter to this card was already having a presence in the field lane, and then having a deck that uh, could effectively deal with the one health Slaughterfish in the shadow lane through removal, through a guard, through something uh, in the first couple turns. So a lot of people complained about this card because they said, well, if my opponent on a clear board plays an early Slaughterfish spawning as early as turn 2 with the Ring of Magicka, uh, and I don't have anything in the field lane, and I don't have any removal for either of the X1s, and I don't get a Prophecy, I wind up losing the game. And I would respond, yeah, that sounds about right. I kind of... You know, guilty pleasure, I kind of like a card like this that's punishing. That's one of the reasons I've always been a fan of Supreme Atromancer. Atromancer punishes you in the late game if you don't have a board in the field lane, and you don't have any removal in the shadow lane, and you don't have any sweepers in your deck, and you haven't already been pressuring. This card was kind of the same type of deal, but much earlier and also mu like much less of a high impact to Supreme Atromancer. Obviously, you're not playing that many stats here. Essentially, just getting a 1-1 one, one in each lane for starters. Uh, if they get answered immediately, uh, then you might actually lose some tempo, but it is kind of punishing to an opponent who doesn't have any removal and nothing on the board. And it is a card that I think kept other decks in check. So, I mean, based on the cards that I think we've... I just mentioned a few of them, like the Drain Vitality, the increased popularity of the Goblin Skulk package, the increased popularity of cards like Dark Guardian and Brotherhood Slayer, which haven't even weren't even in existence during the pre-nerf Slaughterfish spawning. You know, if they continue to be aggressively changing cards, I hope they get even more aggressive about it uh, between the nerfs and also the buffs. Uh, I think Slaughterfish spawning could be a card that rotates back into playability by putting its magic cost back at 3. I, for one, would be incredibly interested to see what happens to current decks if that were a thing, uh, and I think it would be definitely a good move on their part to keep changing cards and, and, and not only just making them better or worse, but maybe changing them back after a while to see how they impact later metas. Would this card still be an aggro staple? Would it still be in as many mid-rangey decks as it was previously? I honestly don't know. This card was accompanied by a couple other nerfs to aggro battle mage that I was a fan of, like the Dark Rift and Gladiator Arena nerfs, and honestly the Slaughterfish spawning nerf, when it was done, made a lot of sense. I just think it's a card that could potentially see the light of day once again. I wouldn't mind it. And, you know, for me, the reason I'm putting it on this list is basically I'm a fan of the design implications, and I've just always found playing the card really satisfying when it was playable. Number two on this list should come as no surprise to anyone who knows my favorite class in the game, and that is Sorcerer, and one of the best cards that's ever been in Legends is the Sorcerer dual attribute legendary High King Emmerich. 5-5 five, five, ward for 6 magicka, already reasonable stats with summon, deal 2 damage for each friendly creature with a ward. I shouldn't really need to talk too much about how good this card is, the value is obvious, I think standalone this might be in a vacuum one of the best cards, if not the best card in the game. Uh, personally, I will play Hiking Emmerich in every single Sorcerer deck that I ever build. I'm pretty sure there's no reason not to, uh, and I'm pretty sure if I could play three copies of them, I would play three copies in virtually every Sorcerer deck that I would ever build. Uh, the card is just insane. Uh, even if you don't really focus on the ward strategy, a lot of people think you need to focus on wards. Uh, there are already enough playable wards in the game, like Windkeep Spell Sword, Wardcrafter, Daggerfall Mage, which are going to find their ways into the majority of Sorcerer decks. But even if you're not taking advantage of the wards, uh, you don't really call ward sorcerer anymore it's just a you know good sorcerer decks tend to play creatures with a ward and even if you don't you're already going to get at least a two damage worth of the effect 
by playing the Emmerich itself because it does have a ward. And this effect can go face, if you can get like a 4 or 6 damage Emmerich to go face, uh, that can just be crazy for your aggressive push. That's also a very versatile removal option. And obviously you're developing the stats on board too. It's a 5-5 five, five body with ward in addition to that crazy effect, which is what makes this card so powerful. Being a unique legendary, it's often uh, very demoralizing to be playing as a sorcerer deck that has a good curve into a hiking emmerich because it's just that one card in the 50, sort of like when you're playing against Ram Scout and they have the exact Odaving at the time they need or the Red Brahmin at the right turn. Uh, that hiking emmerich, uh, when curved into with a bunch of powerful creatures, some of which already have wards, uh, can be almost unbeatable feeling. And I just Personally, despite the card being really, really powerful against me, uh, since I enjoy Sorcerers so much, I had to include it on this list because uh, I enjoy playing the class, and this is one of the most satisfying cards to play. Number one on the list, the answer that I've always given when people come into my stream and ask me what my favorite card in Legends is, is Lightning Bolt. A very simple, and in my opinion, very elegant card. Uh, sort of accentuates all the things that I like about card design. Now a lot of people don't like Lightning Bolt because they say it can lead to some unskillful victories. And of course people are talking about the Prophecy Lightning Bolts that hit you in the face uh, when you're at 4 damage or 4 life or less, uh, and the Prophecy Lightning Bolts that can decide a game when they remove something important. But in my opinion Lightning Bolt, despite being one of the simplest cards in the entire game, is also one of the most skill encouraging cards. When you have a card like this, uh, which is very simple, very easy to play, uh, yet also extremely versatile and can do a ton of different things, even though it's really only doing that static 4 damage, but it can be directed anywhere. Uh, when you have a card with that many options for the effect it has, uh, it really rewards the players who can hold it at the right time, use it at the right time, and then decide where it has to be used. And often when you're holding a lightning bolt, you have to decide where it eventually is likely to make the most impact turns in advance. For example, you might have a good lightning bolt target on the board, but since the lightning bolt can also go face, you might make the call, I'm not going to take this very good lightning bolt on board, I think it makes more sense for me to hold it to face, or hold it for another pressing threat. For example, against a Mark Hearth Bannerman deck, you might say to yourself, okay, I can't take this lightning bolt on the three cost card, I have to hold the lightning bolt because I identify what cards are important in my opponent's deck, and I identify the lightning bolt can be good against them. And when you're thinking about whether to trade with it or go face with it, you're thinking about what role you have in the game, whether you're the aggressor or the defender, and how you're likely to close the game. And all of those things are really important when you're becoming a better player in Legends. Knowing the metagame, knowing the matchups, knowing which cards are in your opponent's deck, and just knowing every turn and, and analyzing and reanalyzing how you're likely to try to win the game. Uh, Lightning Bolt, uh, a card that can be used defensively off a of prophecy, defensively from your hand on any number of creatures, a card that can obviously be used as burn from your hand, and especially in these aggro battle mage decks, that's frequently where it's likely to go, uh, but also can be used as a really powerful removal option even in those styles of decks. So while this card is uh, probably the most simple that I've talked about in today's video of all the five cards, uh, I would argue that it is probably the hardest to play optimally, or at least among the hardest cards to play optimally in all of Legends, and that to me really speaks to good card design, and it's a card that I personally think we're probably going to see as long as it's allowed to be played in its current form as a three of in virtually every single deck using intelligence. Uh, but personally, I'm such a fan of the card design that I don't really mind that. So that's it for me. These are five cards that have really stuck out to me in my time playing Elder Scrolls Legends over the past 13 months. Uh, as mentioned, in the future, some of these could change. Some cards could come into favor and out of favor depending what cards are released in the future. I look forward to revisiting this topic and I also look forward to hearing what you guys have to say. Be sure to leave a comment with your favorite card and let me know what you think about the ones that I've presented, but I'm definitely interested to hear what cards you guys enjoy in Legends and why. And as always, if you've enjoyed the video, feel free to leave a like, stay subscribed to the channel for more Legends content. Check out my stream in the description. I'll see you guys next time time.